the better. So, but before that, let's uh, let's answer some questions. And the first question, and this one's a great one by by Ausboss. I'm gonna answer it while I'm doing a little bit of cleanup on this guy right here. I'm gonna use Trim Dynamic here to start cleaning some of this uh, stuff stuff up. So, if I could go back to the past and tell my younger self something before I started to learn 3D, I would probably tell myself to enjoy the process because. For the longest time, when I was a student, I always felt insufficient. I think that's the word. I felt insufficient and like I was not doing enough to to get where to where I wanted to be. And I remember my first creations. I was always like, ah, I mean, it's cool, but it sucks. I'm never gonna make it and stuff like that. So, so instead of worrying too much about making it or not, like getting into the industry and all that stuff, if I had worried about learning and improving, I think I could have shortened the time it took me to get to a a more comfortable professional level. So enjoying the process, understanding that this is uh, like wine. I always use this reference to wine, right? Um, understand that as you get older, as you get more experience, as you do this for longer, you will get better. You will learn new things. You will learn new techniques, new workflows, and your, your own artistic sensitivity will develop more and more and more. So that would be my advice. Be patient. Patience is, is very important when you're first starting. So yeah, that, that will be my answer, Ausboss. Now, new two is asking how to get started in sculpting. Well, Seabrush is a perfectly good way to do it, my friend. Seabrush is a great software, and I do have a course where I go over the basics. It's a little bit of a, of a steep curve, a steep learning curve. Like it's it's not like it is a beginner level course, but at the same time, I do go like quite hard on it. So you might want to ask some people here on the chat how they they thought it was. But the first two chapters are a way to introduce yourself to these um, to this thing. I was having this exact same problem, then I started sharing you my work and your feedback. And that's exactly it, guys. Like, one of the best things that you can do is not worry. How do you say this? One of the best things that you can do as an artist is focus on the art, not on what other people will say about the art at first, right? Later on, when you get into professional stuff, then yeah, you definitely need to develop certain specific things that people are looking for. But when you're learning, it's more about, again, the journey. Like you need to make sure that you understand the journey and you are learning with every single project. So, so don't worry too much, just do it, just go for it. Your first couple of works are not gonna be great, but as you get like an older and older and you get more experience, things will improve. But the only way for that to happen is by doing it. There's the only way to do it. Renzo says, by the way, the substance painter from beginner to master course is a spot on lit. <laughs> there you go, man, thanks. I'm glad you like it. Ideal Ronnie says, my biggest struggle is reproducing hard surface armors and character, like Halo armor. Any tip for that? Patience, again. You need a lot of patience for that kind of retopology. I showed you guys the... Uh, I have it right here. Where is it? Uh, so 2023 assets dwarf. So for the dwarf character, for the the texture course, I did the shoulder pads. No, that's fine. I I got all of this saved. Not too worried about that. Don't worry. There you go. So this shoulder patch right here. Look at the topology. <laughs> That's the, the tight topology that I went for. And I did this retopology inside of Maya to get all of this like nice crisp curves and, and pinches and everything. But the original sculpt was here inside of Seabrush. But all of this is just clean topology from, uh, from Maya. So, but it took me, I think this whole thing took me like six hours to do. Like the whole... Like from sculpting and then retopo and then like clean uh, cleaning the forms and everything it took me like six hours and uh and yeah this is this is it like this is the sort of like low poly version of the of the ram it's one of my favorite armors by far and uh we texture it on the course stan says hey abe uh, how's it going man i've been selling 3d modeling and texturing for a while now and is it a good time to get in the game industry oh <laughs> you're in the in we are all in interesting times stan and um i actually got a question yesterday i haven't answered it on discord someone sent me a message and they were asking about the same the same exact thing like 
is it a good time to get into the industry? And I'm going to be completely honest with you. The industry is in a crisis right now. We're going through like the dark times of the entertainment industry, not only games everywhere. You have seen this on, on TV series. You can see this on movies. You can see this on, again, games, even books. Have you guys seen like the the problems that book authors are having where where people are flooding like Amazon and things like that with AI generated crap? And, um, and the stories, of course, are not good or anything, but they're just like making it more difficult for someone who's just starting to write to, um, to get their name out there and be featured, right? So, unfortunately, it's one of those, like whenever there's a crisis, the, the best thing that we can do is just wait a little bit and, and try to see where the trends are going, like how the market is evolving, how the, how the jobs are changing. Because if if we just don't do if we don't do the hell I don't have symmetry. It's really weird. Um, if you don't do anything, then you're just gonna be kind of like forgotten, right? So so it's important that we that we try to see where the trends are going. And we try to adapt and, and move with them. But yeah, it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult time. Okay, so we have an issue right here, and um, the issue that we have is that this character, for whatever reason, is not symmetrical on the nose. Like, I remember making it not symmetrical up top right there, but on the nose, that's, that's a little bit weird. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go geometry. I'm going to delete the lowers of the vision levels because we're still going to be adding like a body. So I don't really care about the micro detail. We're going to lose a lot of that. And uh, I'm going to go to geometry, modify topology, and just mirror and weld. And this is going to copy half of it. There you go. To the other half. And now it should be, it should be uh, perfectly mirrored. Yes, we got this extra cut right there, which I actually don't despise. It's looking interesting. But we're going to fix it. I'm going to blend it right there. And later on, we'll just, like, reconstruct it. Do you think it's worth upgrading my Substance copy from 2022 to 2024? Yes, we do have some very cool tools in the newest version of Substance that I do think are, are worth the investment. Yeah, just, just wait a little bit. Keep polishing your, your skills. I mean, if you... If you need to get into the industry because, again, you need to like pay the bills or pay your bills and stuff like that, then, of course, it's going to require a little bit of extra work. Oh, we start with the sneezes. Of course, it's going to require a little bit of extra work because, again, the industry is right now in a, in a really, really weird place. My other advice, and I've been giving this quite a bit, is try to look at other opportunities. Oh, my God. Sorry about that, guys. So try to look for other opportunities where you could use 3D to do work. Like lately, as you guys seen here on the channel, I've gotten a little bit into 3D printing, which is quite interesting. Thank you, thank you. We're definitely going to have to make a sticker of like, bless you, bless you, because we're now in allergy season and... I get my horrible, horrible allergies. Okay, here in the eye, we usually have a, like a little concave area. Now, 3D modelers are going to be necessary. Concept artists are going to be necessary. Everyone's going to be necessary. We're just going to have to adapt. That's the that's the thing. Because this is the exact same thing that people said about like photography and when Photoshop came around in the early 2000s, right? Like, oh, no one's going to be doing any more traditional photography or photo editing. They still do restorations and things like that. When photography came in the early, what, like 20th century, 19th century, people were like, oh, no one's going to be painting anymore. And people still paint. So it's not that it's not that that's not going to like change. Things will change change but um but it's not going to disappear so modelers will still be there uh one of the things that i see happening a lot with with um again ai and the industry in general is that there's going to be more iteration like ai models are going to be doing like the early stages of like the construction of models and things like that but then you're still going to need um 3d artists to to clean them up and do like a bunch of different things okay so before we add the what's the word before we add the whole like uh, details and everything. Let's think about the body. Now, one of the things that I noticed is that this guy's kind of like leaning back. So I'm gonna rotate this so that it's facing more like a front forward facing character. There we go. And originally I did not intend this character to be like a villain or anything, but now he's kind of giving me like, like villain vibes. Um, I did this and you guys have probably seen this. Where is it? There we go. 
So this was one of my early portfolio pieces. Uh, there we go. So this was in 20, six years ago. There you go, six years ago. So I did this one six years ago and I, I made this sort of like a composition where the story behind the composition was, of course, he's an alien and he goes into this cave and he finds a lightsaber, right? So this is after like the whole Jedi cleansing and all that stuff. So he's like a new Jedi. Um, but now I'm thinking maybe he does find the lightsaber, but he's not going to be a Jedi. He might be a bad guy. I don't know. But the first thing is we need to solve what we're going to do with the body. And there's a couple of ways in which you can like expand this character right here. I'm going to be using C spheres because for me, C spheres are, are always very flexible. They're very flexible and they allow me to, to have a little bit more control over what I want to do, right? So I'm going to bring the C-Sphere right here to the torso. And I'm going to draw one C-Sphere on the top and one on the bottom. This is a very important part. I mentioned this on the on the Seabridge course. C-Spheres, especially the, the mother C-Sphere, which is this one right here, for it to work properly, it should always have a C-Sphere on top and a C-Sphere on, on the bottom. Otherwise, it can get you some like really, really weird results. So over here, we're going to add the shoulders. And I, I've been playing uh, a new game <laughs> recently. I've been playing Marble Snap. It's very addictive as well. And um, I saw one character, Purple's Glaive. You know this guy, right? He wants, he, he appeared in the, in the Marble uh, movies. And, and I kind of like his sort of like proportions, right? So it's this kinda like a mantis, this very thin character. So I think we're going to go for something like that. This sort of like creepy, creepy mushroom guy. This guy is, is inspired by mushroom, of course, or by mushrooms. So that means that he's going to have sort of like very, very long arms, right? I also think about the, the white guys from episode two in Star Wars that were very like thin and and tall. Let's add another C sphere there. We're gonna scale it up for the torso. And then the legs. I haven't done a trilateral character in a while. So I thought it would be cool. So trilateral. Let me open create that real quick. This is very interesting. This is uh what I'm gonna show you now is called comparative anatomy. And it's when you yeah, the kami nuance, that's right. Oh, there you go. You know your stuff, Chilla Kid. So in, in the human body. We have the pelvis, right, which is sort of like shape right here. Yes, yes, and everything right there. This is the femur, big femur right there. That looks like a dick. <laughs> Let me get rid of that. So that's the pelvis. This is where the femur goes. It goes down, right? This is where the knee is. Then we got the lower leg. And here's where we got the foot, right? That's like a normal sort of like human, human leg. On animals, like dogs, cats, um, horses, all of this, they still have their pelvis. But what happens is the femur goes forward a little bit more. And then it goes back like this. And then it does this really weird stuff. And we might think that it's very different than a, the, the male leg, but it's actually the same thing. Well, not the same thing, right? But this is the femur. This is the lower leg. This is the ankle. These guys are the metatarsals, which on the foot of a, of a human, if we divide the foot of a human into more parts, that's like the toes, and then the metatarsals, and then the of the heel bones and stuff. So that's the human bones, right? So this is the heel bone right here. All of this are the metatarsals, super long metatarsals, and these are the toes. So a horse is actually standing on its toes, right? Like the little finger that they're touching. It's kind of like if you were walking tippy toe, but their feet gets elongated like this. So same sort of like process or same sort of like components, if you want to say it like that, but they, they are actually work, walking on their toes. Yeah, exactly, exactly ideal, Ronnie. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to add two legs right here. Let me make him really tall. And then we're going to add, that's the knee, that's the ankle, and that's the toes. See that? So that becomes a trilateral sort of like structure. That's the that's the sort of like structure that we normally follow. I think the hips is a little bit too low, so 
it's gonna modify some of the proportions right there there we go i like that now some people like to rotate the feet outwards normally i don't do that because it can become a little bit complicated to to manage but there we go as you can see that gives us a, a nicer like skeleton and we can change proportions and things like that in just a second this is just like the base that i like to to create for myself what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go all the way down to adaptive skin and we're gonna say make adaptive skin to create a skin out of those spheres. and again all of this I, I i cover extensively on the on the seabrush course so let's append this sphere there we go and now those sea spheres we really don't need them anymore so i'm just gonna delete them there you go, Lord Totello, and what's up, man? Thanks for the follow. Also, thanks for the follow to Eras89. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this up. And then on this one, I'm going to say merge, merge down. We're going to combine both of them in a single piece. And we're going to dynamish. So let's dynamish. We are going to lose detail. I'm, I'm perfectly aware that we're going to lose detail. So as you can see, we did lose a lot of detail on the face. And that's fine because I'm, I'm rebuilding this, so... I don't mind. Everything's going great, man. I'm actually very happy to be sculpting. Sculpting is very relaxing to me. Yeah, Burke. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, so we, we already have kind of like a calendar going on, right? We got the the topo, topology topogon course, and then we got the the anatomy and 3D printing course. And after that, I promised we were gonna be doing a creature course, so sort of like the dragon or something like that. Uh, with Mari and, and a little bit more production heavy and then I think I want to do something like what I did with Thyros So I want to do a full course where we go through all of the process, right? So modeling sculpting UVs retopo texturing uh, Even a little bit of rigging and getting the character all the way to to Unreal Engine or to yeah Even a real engine can do like some cool cinematic stuff nowadays So so that's gonna be coming up later. I still don't know if it's gonna be like um like a course or like a workshop like maybe like a couple like a workshop that goes through a couple of months or something i don't know i don't know i need to think a little bit more about how to handle that but yeah definitely definitely want to do something like that there we go now i've i've always liked this sort of like characters um here let me show you again so on, on the human character right on a on a traditional like human character you have the the shoulder right here the shoulder muscle the deltoid and here we have the clavicles and everything and the chest muscle which goes right around the here it goes and it inserts itself on the arm that's one of the rules of muscles that muscles need to cross an articulation for them to do the work if you have a muscle that's not crossing an articulation it doesn't work it's just not functional so the the, um, the pectoral muscle is very funny because it kind of like wraps around and goes into the into the armpit right there, right? And here's where we would have like the what's the word the well the rest of the arm. See, I, I always sucked at drawing, and now that I've been like doing this sort of like sketches, I feel like I'm getting better. <laughs> like at least that the lines look like they have more purpose than when I was just a. Uh, a student so yeah this is the this is the insertion of the of the pectoral muscle but i've seen some creatures where they actually insert the pectoral muscle with like a little bit of a fiber going down here like a little bit lower so kind of like a membrane that happens right around here and i always find that sort of like design choice very very interesting so that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna add that little bit of a membrane have you guys seen those membranes aliens do that do that a lot so even though the the trapecius does not insert that low, I'm still gonna be adding that little membrane right there. Bishal, what's up, man? And remember, guys, right now we have the little exercise. If you're a shy artist, if you don't like to talk in forums, you don't like to post your work in social media and stuff like that, let's start practicing today. Let's start improving that a little bit more. I want to help you out because that that helped me quite a bit when I was uh, when I was a student as well. So try to just say hello. Try to just ask, ask a question. That, that's going to be the, the challenge. Ask me a question right now on the stream. Or not right now. Throughout the stream. And, uh, and I'll be happy to, to help, okay? That way we get you out of the comfort zone. You get to interact. People will see your name. They're like, oh, this guy is sort of an artist. Maybe when they see your name again, you're going to be famous. There we go. So we're going to go for that sort of like membrane right there. Sandra P, what's up? Welcome. 
Yeah, I totally agree, Burke. But the thing is, as you guys know, as you guys know, we started this project just like what eight months ago, and I first need to again do all of the videos and cover all of the basics before we can move on to the next thing. Been looking for some dragon, reptile, croc kind of texturing. I've been facing trouble texturing something. Oh, uh, again, patience. You're going to need a lot of patience because alphas are probably going to be what you're going to be using, right? For the skills and everything. But you pretty much, like, if you want to have a, a nice result, you pretty much have to do them, like, one by one. Like, it's, it's very, like, I don't know. There's going to be, like, a lot of artistic decisions. There you go. How do you practice color theory as a 3D artist? That's an excellent question, uh, Tranquil Dingbat. So, Lord Taylor, what's up, man? So, color theory applies in your choice of lights, for instance, while rendering. Color theory applies on your choice of colors when you're texturing. So, if you're doing a monster, what kind of colors are the skin on the monster going to have? Color theory applies on the types of uh, colors that you're going to have on the objects of a character, right? Like, if you're doing a military character, then probably most of it's going to be like very like green grays darks but you can still play with values you can still play with uh saturations to push the view of um what's the word of the audience right of whoever is watching your work to a specific area that you might want to did you want to you might want to showcase so so yeah there's a lot of ways to to use color theory as an artist i would say Do you have any advice for 3D students that aren't sure what they want to specialize in yet? Yes, I do have an advice. So in the 3D world, there's usually two ways to see things. Some people say you gotta be a specialist and some people say you gotta be a generalist. My advice is, first of all, try to find what you like doing the most and this is very important what you're good at because i've had friends and it has happened to me that say hey i really like doing i don't know animation but they're like dude you suck at animation you're not really that good it's something that you really struggle now can someone who really struggles get better and and become a great animator yes of course but if you pick something that you're good at you're gonna have an easier time like getting to that sort of like professional level so if you like modeling and you're good at modeling cool keep pursuing it but if you're if you like modeling and you're not that good at modeling you might want to look into something else maybe you're very good at rigging maybe you're really good at effects or animation right so if you explore that's my advice for students when they're first learning 3d try to explore as many of the disciplines or the areas as you can so that you find which areas you you enjoy and which ones you don't like and which ones you're good at right so once we have that the next piece of advice is try to focus or try to see what is happening on your local market because not everyone has the chance to emigrate or migrate to to a different country to pursue their dreams right so if you're gonna have to stay in your country or in your zone try to see what you're looking for because if you're in a zone like where, where i'm at right where there's not a lot of game industry but there's a lot of advertisement then being a generalist and being able to do a little bit of everything is 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 for my benefit right because the the kind of work that i'm gonna be finding here is gonna be that type of work and um and that's going to, again, allow you to, to see how things are moving. Mixel says, hope you're doing well. A couple of months finished my game art program and be taught Maya. But I'm thinking of switching to Blender. Do you think it's a good mover or still with Maya? Again, it depends, Mixel. Do you want to work in the industry? Do you want to be an indie artist? Like, well, what's the, the kind of goal that you're going for? Because it really depends on the on the kind of like work that you want to do whether switching to maya or switching to blender from maya is a good idea if you're just going to be modeling it really doesn't matter most of the students now they have like a sort of like a mixed bag of people who do maya and people who do blender but you also need to understand that there's a lot of studios that already have a lot of pipelines implemented right so it's it's easier for them to to teach you those pipelines if you already know the the basic software which in this case by or by large, again, in the in the big industries is uh, is Maya. Solid Mango, yes. So I do have the mentorships available. Mentorships are one hour uh, like sessions that you can book with me uh, through Discord, and that uh, we go over any questions you may have. Some people use those mentorships to to generate a project, and and we work throughout several sessions. Um, you can message me on Discord and I'll give you the, the price and everything. However, um, I do have limited slots available. And right now, I got like two or three students. So it's already eating quite a bit of my time. So I need to... Like if I don't have a space, we might need to schedule it for, for later. 
Starting off says, I'm moving away from Blender over to Maya. And that's fine, like, I, I use both. <laughs> and it's funny, every now and then on the on TikTok or on YouTube, we get, like, hate messages from one group or the other. Don't, don't get yourself too attached to a software. Like, use the software, but understand the principles. Because if Maya dies in the next couple of years for whatever reason, right? Like, anything can happen, and everyone switches to a different software that's going to be called, I don't know, Ultimate 3D whatever. Well, then you're going to have to learn that. But all of the things about subdivision, form, volume, lights, render, rigging, all of those principles, you just need to adapt them to the new tools that you're going to be learning. That's the, I would say that's the secret to learning pretty much any 3D software. If you learn the, the principles behind the tools, it's easier to use those tools and it's easier to change tools if you need to. Which sometimes happens. Like a couple of... Uh, like what was last month we got a little project with uh, someone that was using sketchup and they wanted me to help them and i've never used a sketchup before but hey i know how to extrude i know how to place cubes and stuff like that so even though i could not be as efficient within a sketchup it was more than enough to to generate what i or to, to finish her and do what they were asking for i suck at the grand school can you please guide me to improve at doing so what practice exercises should i follow Oh, that's a great question. Well, I mean, studying anatomy is, is a great way to, to get better at it, um, my friend. I I like doing studies of like skulls. That's a that's a very common one actually on the on the first chapter on the on the zebra scores we do a dragon skull based on a dinosaur skull. So so that I think is a good way to understand forms and understand shapes. But yeah, just, just uh, you, you need to do a lot of comparisons. So you, you sculpt something, and then you compare it, and you're like, okay, does this look like the kind of stuff that I wanted to do? If it does, cool. If it doesn't, what do I need to change? And there's usually three things that can change on a sculpture. You either add more volume, you either remove volume, or you clean whatever volume you already have. That's the only three things that you can do, okay? You can add volume, you can remove volume, or you can clean the volume that you already have. I, I, I like using Trim Dynamic to, to clean my volume. But as you can see in this sort of like early stages that I'm doing here with this alien, I'm just focusing on on capturing like the, the main silhouettes of the of the muscles and the elements. But in order to know where to place these muscles, of course you need to learn anatomy. And I know a lot of people hate anatomy because they find it boring or difficult. It's not that difficult. It is, it is uh, technical. You do need to know several names and memorize them. But once you understand them, and it usually becomes a little bit easier. Yeah, I really like that shape right there. So for instance, right now with this guy, I'm using all the knowledge that I have from, from human anatomy and I'm adapting it to, to the anatomy that he's gonna have, right? So it's not gonna be exactly the same as a human, it's going to follow certain things and certain proportions that people are going to see and they're going to be like, oh, that looks semi-human, right? Like it has some sort of like human inspiration and therefore it becomes relatable. There's a, there's a word that I love called very similitude. You guys heard that word? Very similitude. And it's a, it's a property of, of concepts that look real even though they might or are not real right but they look real enough and they hold enough information for us to pass them as if they're like or that they could actually work and that's a, a very like important balance that movies for instance do all the time they they introduce concepts that of course are not real but we see them and we're like yeah that could work that could happen right like you guys have seen the dune movies like that concept of the spices and the worms and the, and the sand and everything, like all of that stuff, at, at least so far as we know it, it doesn't exist, right? But you you take it within the context of the of the movie and you're like, yeah, this is totally like it works for the world. But if suddenly I added like tiny wings to the worms and they started flying around, you'll be like, that's completely fake. That like even though it's already fake because those worms do not exist, just like looking at it that way will definitely break your immersion because it doesn't hold to what we would consider or qualify as realistic, right? Svarnov has a question, he says, um, well, first of all, Pixel Whale, how much time do you need to learn Seabrush? That's a great question. Do not expect to make great things inside of Seabrush after you've at least spent like six months on it. 
like my first couple of like elements that I did, the first like um, creations that I did were horrible. I've shown you already in, in some of the other streams. They were really bad. So don't expect to be doing like amazing stuff right from the from the start. There are certain guidelines and certain like again tools that you can use to create stuff. And you can see them. Like if you go to the Discord channel, there's the Hall of Fame where people who have never used Seabrush have been taking like the only course and they get a really good result. But I know that if those guys keep working for a couple more months, they're gonna be doing even better things and better things. And, and that's the way it works. Like you need to keep doing things so that you can um, improve as an artist, right? a little bit longer right there yeah six months six months is i would say a good amount of time to start seeing like an improvement and then i would say i would say like the first mark is going to be like six months and then the second mark is going to be like two years and then the next one it will depend on how much time you spend on it but i've seen people improve pretty much every year i've seen people take like two year leaps so i've been doing this for 14 years guys and, and that's another one of the things that i would say or tell my younger self so just keep going man like, I know you want to do and see yourself doing amazing things. It takes time. So focus on improving a little bit every single day. And as you do that, once you hit a, a good amount of time, you're really going to see the, the improvement. Is there any tutorial you're showing how to place textures in Maya for rendering? Yes, of course. We got several of them in, in, the, in the YouTube channel. And we got the, the Maya course as well on my site. Svarnov says, one question, when I import height from Substance to Maya, AI standard using a Substance plugin, height displays on the mesh too much, and I would like it to only affect the lightning. Um, yeah, okay, so you're, if, you, if your displacement is too much, you need to go to the Hypershade and go to the displacement node that gets created that connects to the height map, and there's going to be a value right there. Just decrease it. By default, I think it's set to 1. Just try it like 0.5 or, or uh, 0.1 and play around until you find the value that works with whatever it is you're texturing. It's very case dependent, so I, mean, I cannot give you an exact value, but um, but that's how I would like handle it. I feel like something is off, but I'm not sure what. I think it's the neck. Like I think the body looks very human, and then the neck looks very long. to modify the proportions a little bit here I think it's the shoulders they're way too they're way too inflated so I'm gonna sharpen them up a little bit here and that's the thing right now I'm focusing on on the silhouette of the character not on the on the details right very common mistake that people make when they're sculpting is that they will jump straight into detailing like wrinkles and things like that when there's other things that we need to focus on first because from the back it looks fine is is being a 3d concert artist profitable in terms of income i've i've never been or i've never worked as a 3d concert artist but i do have several uh teachers that do that it's a very niche market you need to be very creative. I'm not like the most creative person. I'm very good at the technical side of things, but once I need to like imagine or create something from from my imagination or from my mind, I do struggle. So, but it, I, I know that it can be profitable. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick check here because I feel like the proportions are a little bit off. I feel like the head's a little bit too big. So that means that I might need to either make the, the body a little bit bigger yeah that that definitely solves it yeah so see that the body was way too small and it would look like a little bit weird so now by making the the body a little bit bigger that definitely helps how did you measure the size of the alien i didn't right now i'm just like guessing it but if we like if we bring we, we can do this like if we go to the tools we got like this uh, human male average size and open it and then we go to the alien sub tool append and we append that guy so as you can see my guy is really small compared to the to the human on on real tool size which is fine
I'm 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 imagining him gonna be like a little bit taller, not super tall, but just a little bit taller, so something like that probably. Right, so so that's my guess on how big or small the alien is gonna be. Have you covered how to composite complete the works for our station? Yes, uh, I do that, Michael, in, in pretty much all of the courses. I always include a, a final chapter of uh, rendering and presentation because I do feel like that's a very weak area that not a lot of people explore. So, for instance, in the Blender course, we do the axe, with, like the very nice presentation. No, Petros, you're not banned. There you go. Gabs, what's up, man? Thank you. Any course on stylized hand painted textures? We have one free course here on the channel, uh, Fear Anna. You can look at just look for hand painted textures, and it's a free. It was actually a live stream that we did uh, last year. You might want to look it up. Yeah, 3D, because 3D is more specialized, is, is far enough. I think. Like, art is, is a specialist, right? Like, there's... Like, if you compare the number of engineers, lawyers, doctors, and all the, those careers to the amount of artists and designers, the proportion is, like, way, way, way too much. We don't see that as much because we're not in those, like, traditional professions. We don't see... Where we don't interact as much with them, right? But, like, I, I think, for instance, here in, in, in the state where I'm in, every year, about... Like 200, maybe 400 doctors, lawyers. Well, no, like engineers, you get like thousands of engineers graduating every year compared to, let's say, 200 designers or graphic designers, right? However, we see the competition within our own uh, sort of like a guild or within our own group. That's where well, it may get a little bit um, interesting. And then within the designer group or within the art group, people who do 3D are even less uh, present. Like I know, for instance, here again in my state, from let's say the 200 people that graduate every year as designers, only about 15 or 20 are 3D artists compared to the other who are illustrators and graphic artists. So, so that's why you might get like better paid jobs as a 3D artist because there's fewer people and it's all about like, offer and demand, right? I kind of want to change the gesture a little bit. He feels a little bit stiff, I think. So, so I'm trying to see. I'm not sure how I kind of want to like, yeah, I think I want to do a little bit of a, of a hunchback sort of effect. Yeah, that looks better, right? Kind of like a there we go more like a like a buck sort of thing now of course we need to to fix some of the chest and the proportions and everything Does rig optimization exist? Yes, yes. There, there's definitely, definitely rig optimization, and and see that's why ideal Ronnie, I don't love the the Blender rigging process because it uses a lot of plugins and optimization that it's good to get the job done fast, but yeah, like as, as you say right there, you might get into some issues where where it's a, a little bit difficult to control or a little bit dense. I'm not a rigger per se, like I know about rigging. I, I teach the basics of rigging as well. But I'm not a rigger, but I've talked to a lot of riggers. And there's definitely optimization to be made. Are you using... No, this is just free-flowing, man. Free-flowing. Arid, saludos a la madre patria, como dicen. España. Now, we did change a lot of stuff here, so I need to add like the, the ribcage border. And then there's gonna be like the stomach. I mean, this does make it for a more interesting silhouette, I think. Now, let's work a little bit on the sort of like trilateral leg. I think now the legs might be a little bit too. 
too long. Yeah, the rigging course I did for next to it, it was just the basics, understanding joint orients, constraints, how relationships work, a little bit of skinning. So it was just like a like an introduction to the rigging world. <laughs> you guys want me to confess a secret about that course? Oh, it's a spicy secret. Uh, I think I'm losing a lot of form there on the legs. Uh, eh, la próxima semana, Aritz Vamos a, a posponerlo para la próxima semana Les pues comentaba que Tuve varias situaciones acá En la chamba y personales que Me impidieron ponerle la atención que se necesitaba Entonces lo vamos a hacer la otra semana So um, One of the reasons why I also left The past uh, channel Was because every now and then I would be asked to do things that felt like really out of my comfort zone, like that rigging course right there. And it was really, really intense. Like it was very stressful to, like I, I just didn't feel, I don't know what the word is, like as honest, I would say, like doing something like that when I'm not specifically a rigger. So yeah, so even though the rigging course, I'm, I'm proud of it and I think it works very nicely because I do teach most of the stuff. I think a rigging course should be done by a rigger. <laughs> That's it. Like, um, if you can get your hands on a rigging course by an actual rigger, I strongly recommend you get that one instead of the one that I did. Again, not because the one that I did was bad, but because you're going to learn more from someone who's, like, really specialized, right? Yeah, no, no, again, Valfian, the, the rigging course is fine. You're going to learn. Like, I I never, like, I would never publish or, or sell or promote a course that I'm not proud of or that I don't think that you guys are going to learn. Never. And I do think that one is valuable, but I do think it's very light, okay? So it's, it's a very light rigging course. It's a very, um, like, introduction-level rigging course. And I, I, I've i gotten feedback from that one. People are like, oh, this is very basic. I was expecting, like, facial rigging and, and deformation and muscle systems. It's like, yeah, no, I'm not that guy. <laughs> you, you're not going to be able to get that from me. Okay? So that that's what I meant. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff, and, and that's another one. No, no, no. I mean... Yes, I, I, I picked the projects, like um, like I picked what the content of the course would be. But sometimes I was told like, hey, we need to do like a rigging course. I was like, okay, well, let me see what I can do. Um, and that was a little bit of stressful as well. Will new courses be available at Udemy? We're, we're checking our options, uh, Sanders. Unfortunately, and I've explained this before, the commissions that uh, Udemy charges are quite steep. I know it might seem like they're not as steep, but we've been seeing some things that are like, oh, that's a little bit shady. So, so for you as a student, you might not see that much of a difference. Um, but for, for me as the artist, I see a lot of difference um, from doing it on our own site. Ah, don't worry, Alpha. Yeah, so realistic clothing, most of the times you're going to be using marbles, man. Like, if you wanted realistic folds and wrinkles and all that, you're going to need marbles designer. Uh, I'm not sure if you have checked the course that I have there on the side as well. And, uh, and then certain small things, you can definitely sculpt. But share that on the, uh, like, tag me on the on the help channel on the, on the Discord, and I might be able to give you a more specific look after the stream. Okay, I like the I like the overall shape. I'm not sure if I should add like a because he's like a like a mushroom kind of guy. So I'm thinking about adding some like things poking a little bit more. But I don't know, it feels like the silhouette gets too complicated, so so let's keep it simple. Yeah, but see, like, uh, talking about the courses, that's one of the things that I like about the, the new site, that all of the new courses, the five new courses that we've created so far, I have complete control over everything. The length, the topic, the characters that we use, everything, everything. And it's very, very liberating. <laughs> yes, of course, Tranquil. 
So what I'm thinking right now is he's a very sort of like organic looking character, very membranous, right? He was originally inspired by like a mushroom. That's why he has this sort of like, uh, like, um, this is like the, the chunk of the mushroom. And this is like the cap of the mushroom. You can see the little dots everywhere. So, so I'm following that sort of like language, that sort of like, um, like movement. Are you going to put an app for it, for the site? Uh, I think there is a Thinkific app. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to check. But to be honest, we did a poll uh, before we launched. And um, people said that like like 90% of people or like 95% of people would watch on a on a computer. So so that's why we're not like valuing the app as, as an important factor. No, Mixel, I don't think I don't think it's gonna replace it. Again, and I've mentioned this before, it's gonna change how we do things, but then we're not gonna like like it's not gonna replace me. <laughs> that I can tell you. Like I'm still gonna be doing 3D, even if AI can do 3D, I'm still gonna do it. I might use AI in certain areas or in certain ways if it helps my pipeline and my process. But um Remember, even like AI cannot replace someone because there's always going to be someone else that needs to be behind the AI to do it. So it's not, I'm not scared about AI. I'm scared about that person that's going to be behind the AI because that's where things can get like very tricky. Yeah, so silhouette is very important when, when designing a character. That's, I would say, one of the big things. Have any clean silhouettes. So for instance, here, like I know this legs suck. Like they suck, suck, suck so bad. So I'm just gonna delete them. There we go. They're gone. That way I can focus on only this part first. And once I'm happy with this part, I just like keep adding the next uh, stages of the of the element, right? And I would say design. Like one thing that you need to know about design is I, I find, I guess this is going to be my own philosophy. For me, design is decision making, right? So when you design something, it's because you're making decisions on why you are adding or removing something from the characters. For instance, right now, um, a couple of minutes ago, we, we moved the character, right? Like we, we made him sort of like more in this C-shaped curve instead of this S-shaped curve. Why? Because I want him to be a little bit creepier. So my decision behind that design choice was I want him to be creepier. And one of the ways to make it creepier is to make him be a little bit more like in this angle, right? So all of the all of the things that I add or remove should have some sort of like explanation. And I, I always tell about the Bauhaus approach, right? Form follows function. So everything you do, at least the way I design my stuff, is I try to make everything make sense. That's it. No, that's fine, Bafflian. That's a great question. And yeah, that's the thing, right? Like, uh, there's always going to be a lot of offers on the on the market. So as you mentioned, there's next to Flip Normals, Normal Workshop, our courses. And it, it can be a little bit daunting to, to try and find, like, which one's the best. My advice is try to find a teaching style that you like. It could be mine. It could be someone else's. That's fine. Try to find a length that you like because some courses are very extensive and some are very brief. So, for instance, I when I was a uh, when I was a student, I didn't like the normal workshop courses as much because they were very fast. Like people talk about them as if you already knew all of the tools from the software. It was very difficult to to follow as a as a beginner. Nowadays, I love them because I don't need to worry about like um, spending too much time learning about the tools because I already know them and I can go directly to the things that interested me. So maybe you're at a point in your career where you need someone like me who likes to like show you every single step of the way and uh, eventually you're gonna jump and, and do other stuff my, my stuff has always been like gears toward beginner students and intermediate level students um, because that's the market that I like to to work with right like that's the, the kind of students that I like to teach uh, how to do 3d however again what you need to do is look for reference look at the results that students get from their courses uh, for mine you can look them at the discord right and that's going to give you an idea of like, oh, okay, so if I do the work and if I follow the instructions, I'm going to be able to get a similar result to this. And if that's something that you find useful for your own career, 
and for your own growth, then that's the way to do it. But I always tell, the, I tell you guys, like, there's, there's a teacher for everyone. Like, I might not be the teacher for you. Some people might watch my stuff and be like, oh, I hate this guy. He is very obnoxious or he uh, goes into a lot of tangents or something. Hey, if that doesn't work for you, that's fine. Like, no one's going to like everyone, right? So, so it's, it's important that you, that you find a style that you learn from, that you like to learn from, that motivates you to keep doing it. Busby says, hi, which graphics tablet did you recommend to use in the beginning, with or without display? It really doesn't matter too much. Like right now I have my display right here, not an update, I've been looking at it. I'm looking at this screen right here to be closer to the camera. Um, screen displays are very cool and nowadays they're very cheap. So this one is the Huion Canvas 13. That's the one that I have. It's very good. Has been amazing for me so far. And, um, but either, either or, like doesn't really matter. When I first started, I didn't have a screen display. I only got mine like two years ago, three years ago, three years ago. I'm able to recover brush strokes. That means that we're running out of memory. Let's delete the quick save. I know, I know. Let's save real quick. Let me, let me check the space because I feel like I'm running out of space. <laughs> Thank you, Abul Fry. I really appreciate it, man. Really appreciate it. I have 16 gigabytes. It's not the RAM. I think it was like actual like disk disk space that I was like getting really low at. See, these are all my drives right here. <laughs> I got a lot of stuff, but some of it like this one, the projects one. This is where I save my recordings. I'm almost four terabytes of recordings, all the courses, all the YouTube, everything. No, I do not use Moodbox. It, it was used in the industry a couple of years ago, but um, I don't think it's used anymore. Like it, it's, it was pretty much replaced by Maya and the Mari. So no, I, I don't use Moodbox. And if people ask me, should I learn it? I don't recommend it, to be honest. Like it, it's better to just learn Mari. Moodbox was really good um, back in the day for like displacement and bump map painting. But again, now you can do that here inside of Seabrush and you can also do it inside of uh, Mari. What the hell's going on with my Seabrush? No, 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 not all SSD. So I got one, two, I got three H HDDs and three SSDs. I'm not sure what's going on. Give me one second, guys. Maybe it got like stuck here or something. Seabrush, Seabrush, Seabrush. Yeah, and I actually need to buy a new one, a new hard drive because I'm, I'm running out of space. Let's try that again. Any more question, guys? Well, this thing freaking opens because I don't know what's going on here. I don't want to reset the computer. We're going to lose the stream. A, a quick way to check if it's Seabrush that's like fucking up is if you go to the task manager and you look at the Seabrush numbers and they don't change, they're completely the same, then that means that Seabrush is like messing up. There you go. The hell was that? There we go. Solid Mango, is there a character you failed to sculpt? 
<laughs> when I was a beginner, yes. I tried doing a female character. Oh my god, it was the thing of horrors. Um, but nowadays, no, I don't think I've had a, a character that I failed to sculpt. The thing is, again, it's time, right? Like, I cannot sculpt a full character in, like, just one hour or two hours. I mean, you can't. But it's not going to be the same quality of a character that's going to spend, or you're going to spend, like, 40 or 50 hours. Do you store all your models in separate? Yeah, so I have one for the fill. I have one SSD for the software. Okay. <laughs> you guys want to see that? I mean, it's a little bit boring, but... So this SSD is a small one. As you can see, it's only 250 gigabytes. This one is for Windows, only Windows. And then this one right here is for Unreal. It's another SSD. It's another small one. It's like 120 uh, gigabytes, and it's only for Unreal. And then this one right here is another SSD, and this one is for all of the other softwares. So Photoshop, ZBrush, everything. Everything is in this one right here. This one is an, an HDD, and this one is for all the files. So all of my um, like Maya files, renders, models, everything is in here. This one's another SSD. I don't even know what I have in there. Oh, this is games. <laughs> this is my games right here. So, so Diablo, Genshin, and all my Steam library. So this is this SSD is only for games. And finally, this other HDD is for uh, more files, like project files. So yeah. So I got. I was wrong. I did not have three and three. It's four SSDs and two HDDs, plus some extra HDDs, um, external HDDs. I'm a beginner receiver, so I wanted to ask that is C Remesher enough for Ritopo? No, you should. I mean, C Remesher is enough for Ritopo if the character is not going to uh, like deform and stuff like that. We've, we've mentioned that plenty of times. But if you're going to be doing animation, you need to do proper retopology. We're going to be covering that in the next premium course, which is going to be all about Topogon, but you can use the exact same elements in other softwares. And it's all, all about like a proper topology for, for optimization, for games, for animation, for bakes, for everything. When you open ZBrush, load the tool and drag the character to edit, it changes the size of... No, it does not change the size of the model. It's, that's just the size of the canvas, or the model on the canvas, so it doesn't change it. I found a cool concept, and I have not yet asked its author for permission to implement it in 3D. Is it normal to do something based on the concept without permission? It is normal. Um, at least when I was a student, like, the online world was not as toxic as it was today. So, like, cancel culture and all that stuff didn't happen as much. Therefore, even if someone was angry that you took their concept, you could just, like, erase it and that's fine. Nowadays, you could get into some serious, like, heat. So, my advice is always try to ask the, the person for permission. And, uh, but, yeah. Like, some people don't answer. Or they are not, like, checking their socials every now and then. So, if you like a concept and you like, want to do it, do it. Worst that can happen is that they tell you to take it out or something. Always give credit to art. The artist will be the, um, the stuff. Any sneak peek for the course? Nah, not yet. I mean, to be honest, there's not a lot of sneak peek because it's a very technical course. It's, it's just retopology. So, so that's why I don't have a lot to show. I mean, I've done a couple of the chapters already, but... Uh, I mean, I, I do have something here. So, on the first... The first the exercise that we do... For the retopology is this one right here. So this is a ring I did a couple of years ago, and we retopologized this ring for for like a game, right? So we get it game ready with proper topology and everything. So that's that's the first exercise. Wheel, uh, not much, man. I mean, we've been working on this character for what, like an hour now? Yeah, like an hour. How important do you think Photoshop knowledge is within the 3D industry? Like, where and how do you use Photoshop? I I think it's it's important to know the basics. Um, you might not need it all the time, but at least for me, I use it every single day. Like Photoshop is one of those licenses that I pay like religiously every month because I know I'm going to be using it in After Effects, but I do a lot of editing and stuff for myself, right? Like all of the courses and everything, it, it requires a different kind of approach. And as I've mentioned before, here in Mexico, we do a lot of advertisement work. So I do use Photoshop a lot. Now, if you're a 3D artist and you're going to be doing more things like film, you might want to invest a little bit more into things like Nuke, for instance, for compositing. Uh, I think that one that one could be valuable. Uh, or even like Unreal Engine with its like tools. So, yeah. Was there ever a time in your life you were struggling to find the motivation to finish your projects? If so, how do you overcome that? Dude, I, I, I struggle with that all the time. 
Um, I was reading a, a someone someone's approach or, or opinion about this, and it's it's really interesting. I'm I'm, I'm gonna go full screen because I think this is quite valuable. We as artists, we we live in a very or we we choose to live in a very. We as artists choose to live or do or work in a very lonely industry. Even if we're working in a team or in a studio, what we do is very personal, I think. Um, it's it's as valuable as any other work out there, but we, we literally put a piece of ourselves into everything that we do. And when we don't find that motivation, it's very draining because not only do we feel like we're failing professionally, but we also feel like we're failing personally because we cannot put that little soul into the things that we're doing. So the things that have helped me are three. First of all, taking breaks. It's very important to take breaks. And unfortunately, this, like our current society looks down on doing that, but it's very important that we take some breaks every now and then to, to free our minds and to recover that little bit of inspiration or motivation. Second, discipline. You ve you need to be very disciplined on what you do. So even if you don't feel like doing something because it's like not you're not like it's not working for you at that moment, try to find a way to be disciplined and either advance on that stuff without the motivation or find other things that can help you grow as an artist that will eventually help you on the thing that you're struggling with. And the third one is look for inspiration in other mediums because we tend to be very self-absorbed in what we do, right? In video games, in, in movies, in series. And we, we, we compare ourselves against the best ones out there on that discipline. But then if you look into other things like art, like, like books, poetry, um, nature, there's so many other things out there that you can use for inspiration. Even, uh, for instance, um, I don't know, like if you like cooking, if you like uh, doing other type of like creative work, but it's not like just art related, right? It can bring that spark back and give you energy to keep going on the stuff that we do. Um, so yeah, that's the, I, I would say that's my take on, on how to get through that like, sort of like hub, right? Like try to find motivation, try to find inspiration, take breaks. It's perfectly fine to take breaks. And uh, sometimes it's just discipline. Like, you just do it. You just do it. Is drawing a necessary element for learning? No, no, no. It's not It's not necessary. It helps. Like, if you can learn a little bit about... Like, I suck at drawing. Like, you saw my little sketch a couple of minutes ago. Like, I suck at drawing. But I know the very basic just to get an idea across. Which, for me, it's, it's more than enough. It helps again it helps one thing that does help is like um, perspective like knowing a little bit about perspective and proportions and form and again if you learn that in drawing that could really or potentially save you i kind of want to try something crazy here with the arms i kind of want to give it like a like a weird curvature but i think that like makes it look too way too weird so maybe just like a kind of like a leaf pattern sort of thing, or like a branch. You know how branches sometimes curve like very crazily. Yeah, that that's a tricky one, Evil Fry. Here, I'm, I'm gonna show you. This is a let's do a little bit of an anatomy, anatomy lesson. Okay. If I find a good character designed in an old game like Sacred and trying to recreate it, I will be in trouble. Uh, if it's for for um, educational purposes or like your portfolio or to learn, it's very difficult that you're gonna get into a problem. But here, I'm gonna give you an example of how I could get into a problem very, very quickly, like super fast. The next course, as I was mentioning after the retopology one, is we're gonna be doing a superhero. And one of my favorite superheroes is Black Bolt from Marvel. I've always loved his design and his like character, everything. It's just like super cool. So if I said, hey, we're gonna do a Black Bolt statue and I'm gonna do a full course and I'm gonna sell that course on how to do like a Black Bolt statue because it's like an anime and everything, I would get sued, like a straight suit. <laughs> There's no way I could save myself from a, from a, um, from a, um, what's the word? 
from a lawsuit because it's just copyright infringement, right? So, but here's what I can do. Like, I could literally start sculpting Blackboard right now here on the live stream as a, just like a fan art project. I'm not going to sell it. I'm not going to distribute it. I could print it for myself and have my little black ball statue right here. You're fine. Like, that's that falls under something called fair use, right? So as long as you're not, I'm not a lawyer, okay? So this is not legal advice, but usually as long as you're not profiting, damaging the brand or affecting them in any way, you're usually, again, in fair use. So, so yeah. Drop a creature realistic texturing video. Uh, we got the, the texturing course already, man. The the substance course and all of the things that I do there can be applied to a texture, to like a creature. So, so you might want to use that. Okay, so here's the anatomy, the anatomy class. So we have uh, the sternum, right? The sternum is made out of three parts, which is the head of the sternum, the body, and the apophysis, uh, cyphoid apophysis, apophysis cyphoid, it's in Spanish. It's the little thing right there. And then up here, we got the clavicle, kind of like a, like a bike's handle that goes all the way to the shoulder, right? So something like that. And then over here on the back, we have the scapula. And here we have the humerus, which is the, the arm muscle or the arm bone. There we go. So that's like the basic structure. And of course, over here, we have the, the rib cage. So that's the rib cage of our character. So the reason why the, the shoulder connection becomes tricky is because we have three main muscles that we need to, to think about. The first one is the pectoral muscle. The second one is going to be the deltoid. And the third one is going to be the bicep, okay? Those are the three muscles that make up the, this whole thing. To explain this in the best possible way, I like to start with the bicep. So the bicep inserts itself on the top of the head right here and on the scapula, or there's, a, there's just some fancy names there on the anatomy side of things. And it goes down here, and here's where we're going to have the, the deltoid, right? It's a two-headed muscle, that's why, the, the bicep, sorry. It's a two-headed muscle, that's why it's called the bicep. It has two heads, two, like, um, like muscle masses. And then it goes all the way to the forearm. It needs to cross the, the whole arm, because when you compress the bicep, it brings your arm forward. So that's the bicep right there. Generates this sort of, like, cylindrical shape going down the arm, like that. Then we go with the pectoral muscle. The pectoral muscle starts on the on the rib cage and on the sternum right here, and it goes and it inserts itself on this side right here. Actually, no, not that. Side. Yeah, yeah, it's that that side right there. And it goes around. See that? It creates like a little bit of a concave area around the bicep, like this. So it goes in this direction, and finally the deltoid covers everything up, right here. It hugs everything, kind of like a like a lith, just like going on top of the whole thing. So that's why you get that sort of like like weaving interpolation on the on the muscles, where again the biceps at the very bottom. You can see them right there. See how the biceps coming out from underneath the um, the the pectoral muscle, and then the pectoral muscle goes on top, and then the deltoid goes on top of all of them. So right here, of course, it's an alien, so I'm changing things a bit and I'm merging the deltoid and the pectoral into sort of like a single muscle on this area right there. Yeah, the the portfolio review is going to be next week, my friends. In case you're just like arriving, we're, we're doing sculpting today and the portfolio is going to be next week. Now, I'm going to I'm going to push the arms a little bit higher up. So, I'm going to use select lasso or mass lasso. Let's move this right around there to the shoulder area. And the reason I'm going to push them up a little bit is because eventually for retopology, right? We want to make it a little bit easier to retopologize that inside of the of the element. Yes, of course, man. Some data. We got uh, we got tutorials here on the YouTube channel as well on, on Silver's Hard Surface. I do a med kit. And I think that one works or looks quite nice. That design looks awesome. Which one? This one? Do you guys like this design here for the hands? Like, we're going to change the hands, of course, but... I don't know. It's definitely a little bit... Like, I, I remember one of my teachers, Jared Kruczewski, 
he is a he's an amazing 3D concept artist. He does some live streams for the Noman channel as well every now and then. He one of the critiques or the feedbacks he had for me is like you need to go a little bit crazier on your silhouettes. Because he he always told me you, you do silhouettes very controlled, very like human like, so very humanoid. He's like, that's fine for humanoid characters, but if you want to do alien characters, you might need to to break away from that every now and then and and try something a little bit more exaggerated. So that's why I'm trying to break the my mold there a little bit with this like sort of like curved hands. Forearms are again a little bit complicated. Um the thing with the with the arm in general, it's like two chains interlinked between each other like this, right? Well, actually. Like this. So you got two cubes, but the cubes are going in like opposite directions. So if you see like a side view or like a three-quarter view of the arm, you're gonna have the deltoid on top, right? And then on the front, you're gonna have the bicep. On the back, you're gonna have the tricep. And then right here, we got the flexors and the extensors. And they're gonna be coming like thin as we go towards the, the hand. So you got this one, two, three, four, five. So uh, we, we talked about this before, right? Like the water metaphor. So it's always a, a change in direction. Like the planes are constantly changing um, as you go down. So that's what I have right here. So the bicep, I definitely need to modify this a little bit right there. Now this one, I'm making it very sort of like soft and, and round, very organic. But you can also go and use Stream Dynamic, for instance, to, to sharpen some of the forms up. And, and again, they kind of like interlock. So they do this sort of like thing right here where, where the, the, the muscles of the, um, what's the word, of the head or the, or the forearm, ah, of the upper arm, they interlock with the muscles of the, of the forearm. So you can see when you see it from the side view right here, these muscles are interlocking, but they're going to be very flat when you see them from the front. And then all of these muscles are going to be, yeah, it's like the chain, exactly. Yeah, yeah they mentioned that in... And then let me for sculptures. Or here we're gonna have the the elbow. So here I, I do like this sort of like extreme shape. But we're gonna be pushing this to the other side. Emmanuel says, I want to ask you, how did you improve your English, especially your speaking skill fluently? I speak or I spoke. That's how you improve it. See, I have this issue with my <laughs> with my wife. She knows English, but she feels very shy about speaking it. I just didn't give a shit. I just started speaking. I was making a lot of mistakes. People sometimes would correct me. I was like, oh, no, that's not how you say it. You say it like this. It's like, oh, okay, cool. And I'll just fix it and just keep doing it. Uh, now, I do. I, I did have a did have a great teacher in, in, in middle school. She was amazing, amazing English teacher. I learned so much English from her. And she encouraged me to do three things. She was like, you need to watch a lot of series, like programs. So I watched Friends back in the day without subtitles or with subtitles in English. So not in your native language. Just watch shows and see how they speak. Then read. If you read a lot, you also learn a lot about the language, right? And finally, back in middle school, we had this um, exercises. Every week, you would need to do a speech for like three or five or sometimes even 10 minutes about something. So I remember the topics were like, okay, you're gonna speak for three minutes about your favorite TV series, or you're gonna speak about for, for five minutes about your hobby. Or you're going to speak about, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes about a topic you really master. And you would just do it in front of the classroom. And she would correct you. She would grade you. It was an amazing practice. And I remember um, back then, you could volunteer to do it. So she would ask, who wants to go first or who wants to go this week? And I always volunteer. I was like, I was like one of those nerd guys, <laughs> very obnoxious kid who always raised the hand and I was always at the front of the classroom. So I was always like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I will do my, my speech uh, like assignment. And hey, that's what got me. It gave me a lot of confidence to just like learn the language and, and, and improve upon it. Just but says, do you use sculpt? Uh, do you do you sculpt only in Seabridge? Only recently asked. I use Maya. I'm wondering if you would have any common tips. No, no, don't don't sculpt in Maya, man. Don't don't do that to yourself. <laughs> Maya sucks at sculpting. Like it's really, really, really bad. Like I would rather just sculpt on Mudbox than in Maya. And I just mentioned that Mudbox sucks. <laughs> so no, no, no. If you want to sculpt on something other than Seabridge, Blender is perfectly fine. And I do have a a video here in the YouTube channel as well about like the basics of sculpting in Blender. And um, and you can get you can get some very nice results. I've seen people do really really cool characters and everything inside of Blender, so it's not 
Um, it's not bad. It's really good. Blender for sculpting. But Seabrush is still king. No, I don't think I'm going to do a course on plasticity, man. I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, like, use that software. Okay, let's delete the hands now. Now it's time to do the hands. I'm going to show you another process on how you can do the hands. First of all, I'm going to clean them up a little bit. So this will be like the wrist, right? And if anyone has, like, an action figure, action figures are great to... To understand proportions as well. And how like the connections and articulations work. So you can see even though I'm using a very weird looking sort of like forearm shape. I'm still following certain like rules. Nomad sculpt. Nomad is for an iPad right? I do have an iPad but I don't know how I could stream. Maybe we'll do a stream or something like that later. <laughs> That's how you learn Spanish? There you go. Yeah, I'm from Mexico, by the way. Someone asks, right? Santiago. I'm from Mexico, my friend. Orgullosamente Mexicano del Norte. North of Mexico. I used to have... I got Forger a while back when I had another iPad. And it was, it was fine. But see, I, I do this professionally, right? So... Every single career, every single hobby has like the entry level stuff and then the professional level stuff. Seabrush is the professional level stuff. If you want to do professional stuff, you gotta learn Seabrush. There's no no other sort of like option, to be honest. As of now. I speak carne asada Tadeo, what's up, man? Yes, I speak the carne asada language. Tadeo is a very close friend of mine. Gracias, mi estimado. Y esa es una de mis metas, el, o de mis objetivos, que la gente vea que aquí en América Latina también tenemos muy buen talento y hay muchas cosas muy, muy chingonas que se pueden hacer. Yeah, yeah, Stan, I totally understand. And uh, believe me, I was one of the first ones to criticize when Maxon bought Seabrush and they changed their professional license stuff. Like that, if there has ever been, well, I mean, there's been a lot of anti-consumer moves, but that one was just like a freaking kick in the nuts. It's like horrible, horrible decision. But hey, what can we do? I mean, I could just like stop paying for Seabrush. Right now I got the 2024 version. I pay my monthly subscription. I could stop and use my old version of Seabrush, the 2022. But they did introduce a couple of extra tools that I have been like quite handy. And so yeah. Hopefully, I, I actually do hope that Blender eventually gets to the level of Seabrush for sculpting. But since they're built differently from, like, the programming side of things, it's difficult. Like, I know it's very difficult, for instance, for Blender to handle, like, millions of polygons. And they've been improving quite a bit. So, for simple stuff, it's perfectly fine. But for more advanced things, you probably do still need Seabrush. So, for the hand, this is something that I don't do very often. But I'm going to show you. Which is, you say C-Sphere for the hand. So I'm going to build a hand from a C-Sphere. So that I have a little bit more control over the gesture. And the reason why I don't do it is because when you do fingers with C-Spheres, you tend to have a, a lot of overlap. That's going to be the palm right there. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And then we're going to create the thumb. So that's the base of the thumb. That's a finger. Now, how many fingers should we do? Two fingers or three fingers? Two fingers or three fingers? Three fingers. Let's do three fingers. Yeah, so I know that Maxon now has this option for students, which is very cool. $10 for six months. But you're not going to be able to use that for professional work later on. A lot of people do it. And hey, I mean, if you want to play that game and, and risk a lawsuit or some legal issues, that's fine. But um, unfortunately, once you start working and you're actually like getting revenue from using the software, you are going to need to pay for, for your license. And that's the problem for, for us, right? So I pay, I think it's $45 every month, which is, I mean, it's not horrible. 
almost like a game. <laughs> I could be buying a game every month instead of paying for Seabirds because I, I already paid for like the full lifetime license when when Seabirds was part of uh, Pixel Logic. So that's what makes me a little bit angry. It's like, oh man, I already paid back in the day. I think I paid like eight hundred dollars or something for the for the license. And it's like, well, but at the same time, someone's mentioning there it it uh, it is a a tool, right? So if I can get those $45 back, right, from selling my work or, or selling a project or whatever, then it's, it's just a tool. You, you invest it, you, you can even, like, uh, use it for tax deduction and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things, right? Giving a little bit of gesture to the fingers, so curving them up a little bit. Thumb? I always struggle with the thumb. But that looks quite nice, actually. Because the thumb goes in a different direction, right? Like, in a different angle. And it has less uh, divisions or segments. Thumb has two segments, and everything else has three. Now, the reason why I'm doing it with C-Series is, again, to have a little bit more control over the placement. And a very common issue with fingers, especially later on with retopology and bakes, is that when fingers are really close together, right, you get incher, like, connection between the bakes. So so things bake from one side to the other, and that's, uh, that's not ideal. So one of the reasons why I like this method is because you can rotate these guys out a little bit, like this. See? That gives you a little bit more space for the um, for the retopology process and also more space for the for the baking process. And later on the rigger will just that, that's a problem for the rigger, right? He's gonna maybe have to um, to move things a little bit at rigging time. Again, I, I've talked to, to some rigging friends, it's really not that big of a deal. Like some people, some riggers do prefer like completely straight fingers. But to be honest, it's not that difficult to to rig a finger. As long as the finger itself is straight like this, it's not too big of a deal to, to do it. There we go. So we press A. That's a that's a good form. Again, it's just a base shape, right? It looks good. So let's uh, make adaptive skin and make adaptive skin. This, this C-Sphere method, by the way, is, um, again, I've mentioned before, I'm not sure if we can link it, Sarn, but we can link the the Seabrush course, the Oni course. Did you guys see the full Oni? Did I show it to you? Give me one second. blurs my face but this guys this is the the only course that we did this is the 3d print i've been testing the new elegu saturn that they sent me and i printed this 20 centimeters so quite quite big hopefully it doesn't blur too much but there you go so this one print in a single piece so single single print it's not hollow i wanted to try how how heavy this can get this is almost like half a kilogram so it's very 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 heavy go very heavy and uh, and you get a very nice result and it's quite big this is the like i was comparing it to a six inch figure so this is like a marble legends As you can see this is bigger than the marble legends there you go so if you want to know how to do that only right there sarn is going to link the course in just a second there we go so let's make the that tip skin and we are going to append and append that one. Now from here, we can start working. Let's get rid of transparency. 
And one of the things that I don't like about uh, Sea Spheres is that they do add a little bit more volume in certain areas that you really don't need them. So all of this inside of the hand, for instance. I'm gonna press W. We're gonna do some adjustments, of course, once we combine with the with the rest of the arm. We definitely need to thin this out. Now, one thing with hands is I tend to like to do them a little bit bigger than they should be. And the reason for this is because hands and faces are very expressive. So if you make them a little bit bigger, you can express a little bit more. That's a trick I learned from my sculpture teacher, John Brown. Hand-painted masterclass. No, no. See, see, that, that's the thing. I, I, I was telling you guys, there's so much... So, so, like, I cannot teach everything, and I don't intend to teach everything. There's this guy, Jose Da Vinci. I think he's from Spain. He's fucking amazing, guys. Like, this guy, look at this. Look at the freaking detail that he paints. And he paints sometimes with airbrushes and sometimes with, uh, with normal brushes. Like, I would love to do a collaboration with this guy sometimes. Maybe we can send him, like, a 3D file or something. Because look at this detail, guys. Like, fuck. <laughs> like, I see his miniatures and it's like super, super, super... Oh, that's right. Sorry, sorry. There you go. Sorry, sorry. There you go. There you go. I always forget to change. So, yeah, this is the... Um, this is the guy I was talking about. Uh, Jose Da Vinci is his name. So, if we... If you check his stuff, he's, he's so good, man. And he paints so small. Like, I know he could do magic with the Oni because the Oni is way, way bigger. But, uh, yeah, if you guys want to learn how to paint, like, this guy, he's the best. Well, not, I'm not sure if he's the best, but he's really freaking good. Uh, he does uh, speak in Spanish, um, but everything's subtitled, as you can see right here. So, really, really powerful guy for, for freaking hand painting stuff. Really, really good. But maybe, maybe we could do the Oni for a digital hand painting. Because that, that would be a little bit different. But yeah, if you want to learn like a miniature painting, this guy's the this guy's the way to do it. Yeah, right? <laughs> if your name is Da Vinci, you should at least own it. Sorry about the camera. I always forget about the freaking camera. You would think after streaming for so long that wouldn't happen as often, but. Hey, I guess always learning, always improving, right? There we go. So yeah, now as you can see here, this is what I was mentioning. I'm making the, the hand a little bit bigger than, than normal, because that's going to give him a little bit more power as well, right? It's going to look more impressive. And now I'm going to start like thinning things out to kind of like create the sort of like transition from the forearm to the hand which the transition in this area tends to be quite flat. So I, I, I do want this hand to be powerful, but not like, super thick. Like, it's not the Hulk, right? So we're just gonna use the move brush here to create that connection. It's kind of like a chicken leg. That's another thing that I explained about muscles. The muscles will always have like the big volume closer to the center of the character. So in this case, closer to the arm. And then as they go towards their insertion point, they're gonna have a lot of tendon stuff and they're gonna become thinner. That happens with the, ar the forearm, it happens with the lower leg, it happens pretty much everywhere. Like things thin out as they go outside of the, of the range of the, of the body pretty much. Now here, as you can see, we're already losing that sort of like interesting curvature that we had before. So we need to, like again, this is an exercise I'm doing for myself because I wanna, I wanna force myself to do something slightly different. So I'm going for this like extreme silhouette right there. Now some people find it a little bit difficult to see it without the mirror. So let's mirror the thing. There we go. And that looks it looks interesting. Definitely needs some work still, but it's getting there. Ajid, what's up, man? Good to see you too. Welcome to the stream. So who that's watching right now has not done the small task that we established at the beginning of the stream. Remember, the task was to ask a question. I want to help you guys get out of your shy... Oh my god. 
get out of your shy zone and um, and just ask a question. Nothing's gonna happen. I'm gonna answer it. We're gonna learn, and everything's gonna be fine. Oh my God. I don't know. It's not. It's not anatomically correct, man. Like that's is this is like a bizarre sort of thing that I'm doing, and I'm I'm taking a little bit of inspiration from uh, Neville Page. So Neville Page is a creature designer, and a lot of his stuff is very like that, like organic, wonky, very. Thank you, thank you. Very intense looking. He did the Cloverfield monsters, and you can see the Cloverfield has has that sort of like really intense curvature on the on the arms. Look at that. Right, so, so I'm going for a little bit of that. Some people might think that looks weird or bad. Some people might really like it. I personally really like it. I think like it's very, very unique, as you can see right there. So it's just a matter of making it work, right? So I that that's why I was mentioning that I, I definitely need to to do something here to to change some of the silhouettes, maybe to to make this flow a little bit better. There you go. How to sculpt realistic eyes from Breakster GMR. I'm not sure if I've done eyes before. On stream, I mean. We do them on the Oni. I'm not sure if I've done them on stream. I think I did. Didn't I? Uh, Anatomy for a Sculptor has a very nice like diagram on the depth of the eye. I would say that's one of the, the secrets to sculpting a good eye. Yeah, he was on face-off as a judge, childish. Decals and atlases, have you worked on this before? Yes, of course. Of course, of course. So decals are usually transparency elements that you use in games, like blood splatter, gun marks, dirt, things like that. And they they are laid on top of, uh, of an object to add more detail without having to have it permanently on the texture, which is a great way to, to add that uh, detail, right? And atlases are like big maps. It's kind of like Udems, I would say, that you can use to reference specific parts of your element. I don't use those as much though, to be honest. We did a project ooh, several years back, like in 2016, and we were using quite a bit of atlases. But I haven't used them since. Yes, exactly. Decals are like stickers. And what they do in shooters a lot is they will spawn those where they detect the hit of the of the rate that's traced from the gun. And then a couple of seconds later or minutes later, they'll just like despawn them or remove them. So they spawn them on literally one polygon and, and that's it. Ausboss, that's a really good question. What's the what are the similarities and differences between a gaming portfolio and a movie portfolio, specifically for character art? So for character art for games, you would expect to see optimization. So good retopology, good use of texture space, good use of material divisions. For movies, you would expect to see a lot of detail. So you want to be able to see pretty much every single pore on a character's skin, right? Displacement maps. You want to see uh, UDEMs. You want to see good material usage, like uh, subsurface scattering and things like that. But on both of them, like the similarities, you need good proportions. You need good anatomy. You need good, um, what's the word? A good style, of course. So, like the basics are still there. It's just the... I think the, you know what what's going on here the elbow was way too low see that see how that immediately changed the, the proportions there on the character it was definitely affecting it yeah atlases are like they they use them quite a bit see 3d it's kind of like a like a texture but it's bigger 3d texture atlas so something like this okay so instead of having five of them in five separate elements you combine them into like a giga texture or like a big texture like this one right here and then you just map specific sections of your uvs to those textures it's just quite a bit for it's, it's kind of like uh like trim sheets it's similar to trim sheets not the exact same thing but similar to trim sheets where where you have uh yeah just like a they use this a lot for for foliage like this so this is an atlas right for a foliage 
and what you do is you just map specific elements to to those uh, to those parts of the uh, of the of the texture. So for instance, this one, right? So you have an atlas of, of leaf textures, but you're gonna be repeating the same leaf. So you're gonna be positioning your polygons several times on each individual leaf until you get something like this. Okay, so this is an atlas. So it's just like a like a library of of textures that you can reference on your decals. You can you can see it like that. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Hudson says it right there. It's stream sheets, but for scattering. I've also seen them used for for vegan environments, though. So I I don't remember what game it was, but they use atlases to texture their environment. Uh, I don't do a lot of uh, substance designer, man. Unfortunately, sorry, Hudson. It's not something that I've studied too much because it's not something that we use a lot here, at least in the in the projects that we do. So I'm not gonna be able to to help as much there. Add an extra cut right there. Here I'm just sketching some more details. Kind of want to make a hole right there, but I don't know. It will look weird. Rafa Fabris, what's up, my friend? Welcome. Yeah, they use that a little bit more for environments. And again, it's it's a very specialized software, Substance Designer. So you need to be working at a very big studio that has people who are just working on Substance Designer for like very extreme optimization and things like that. That's why I don't do it because I'm more of a generalist myself. And therefore those sort of projects, I'm not working on those sort of projects as much. I feel like the clavicle is a little bit low. The notes are so hard to keep track of. Once you understand, uh, it's similar to, to Unreal. You don't need to know every note. You need to have an idea of what you want to do. And then you look for the note that's going to help you get to that idea. I also heard that that's the way like programmers learn. Like if you try to learn a programming language by learning the language, you're going to have a horrible, horrible time. But if you try to, to like, if you give yourself a task, right? Like this is what I want to achieve. And you learn the tools to get to that task. That's going to make it a lot easier to, to understand and, and build towards that goal. That's why I think goal oriented learning is the way to go. Not just repetition and memorization. It's about like, why am I doing this? Oh, because I want to get here. Cool. That's why project-based learning. I've always I've always thought that project-based learning is, is probably the best way to learn. I know some people learn from other types of learning. To me, again, project-based learning has always been very helpful. Exactly. Yeah, that's right, Hudson. That's completely, completely right. Petro says, curved bones and muscles are nonsense and bring uncanny. Yeah. Yeah, I can see I, I can I can see that uh argument. But it's supposed to be an alien, so we can definitely play a little bit with the like the curvedness of it, I think. I've been trying to learn more about Wayfinder style lately. I even I even posted the high poly there, but there's so little content about hand painted plus PBR, especially for props. Yeah, there's not a lot of stuff. I, I know some people who used to work at Blizzard are doing their own stuff as well. Uh, they usually use uh, 3D code for that, which is what I used on the little free class that we did. So you might want to check into that. But yeah, I I, I agree. Yeah, for 3D printing, you don't need any optimization. Like this right here, I could just like 3D print it as is. Like, no need to do retopology, no need to do anything.
An, an environment artist can be part of a game development team and also in a film team? Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Like, um, it, well, it's not only about optimization, it's also about the, the tools. Because, for instance, an environment artist for games needs to also really know the engine, right? Like Unreal Engine. And he needs to know how to use the tools within the engine, such as landscapes and, um, and instances and, and uh, procedural texturing, stuff like that to, to generate whatever it is they're, they're trying to get. And uh, for film, it's different. You need to know the render engines, like you need to know, I don't know, Bifrost, for instance, or you need to know about Blender and Cycles. So I, I would say they're, they're quite different in that sense. But if you're just like creating props for environments, arches and ruins and houses and things like that then yeah it's it's fairly fairly similar i would not do clothes inside of simmers childish i would just marvel's designer i know it's an extra software and i know it's extra money but to be honest even though simmers has some nice like dynamic uh dynamics features you're not be like there's no way they're beating uh marvel's designer and again that's what you need to understand or actually i, I want to make this very clear for everyone guys once you're in production like once you're producing a project right let's say let's say you childish come to me and they're like hey i need you to do a character that's wearing realistic cloths with wrinkles and everything and all that stuff right like cool i'm gonna charge you x amount of money and in that x amount of money i'm including the license for seabrush the license for marvelous the license for substance the license for maya the license for topogon maybe so in my cost you know how much it's gonna cost you to do that or for me to produce that for you i am gonna be including the softwares that i know are the best to do the job and then once the project is done that's it like i don't pay for the softwares anymore so so that's how you that's how you do it because if you, you just give a flat price and then you're gonna buy all of the licenses for yourself that makes it uh, unprofitable, right? Like, it's just not going to work. Yeah, yeah, that's how you do it. You charge for what you're going to be using. You charge for the computer. You charge for the... Um, what's the word? For the light, all right? Energy that you're using. So, Alston, what's up, man? Welcome. So, that's how you build a budget. So, uh, I know we don't talk about that too much. Because most of the people that are watching my content are students. But once you're in the professional setting, every time a, a project comes in, you budget everything. Everything. And that's a very common, like, first mistake that freelancers do. Like, they will charge way lower than they think. Because they think, oh, I already have my computer. I already have my softwares. I already have my, um, I don't know, uh, my tablet and everything. Yes, but you're going to be using it. And your computer is going to, like... It's not going to suffer damage, right? But it's going to be used. Um, your software is going to be used. So so you pass that cost to the client. You don't absorb that cost yourself. You need to to, to budget it. So for instance, let's say a good way to do it is uh, like for your computer, right? So if my computer is worth, just to give an example, $3,000, right? I'm going to multiply that by, um, or actually I'm going to divide that three thousand dollars by 24 months which usually myself i change a couple of components every two or three years roughly so two two years i i am I'm, I'm hoping that my computer will last me for at least two years so that's 125 dollars per month if i'm gonna be doing a project i'm at least going to be charging 125 dollars for that project as part of the cost because that's how much i'm gonna be using the computer for the project right so if it's gonna be a three-month project well you multiply that by three and that's the cost for a computer and then you add i don't know like 75 dollars for the um, what's the word for the light for the energy it's gonna cost you on those three months and then you add the software so it's gonna be Let's say it's, it's ZBrush, right? So it's going to be like $150 for ZBrush for three months. And then, I don't know, like another $150 for Maya. And then another like $150 for Topogon. And then I think it's like $150 for the Adobe suit. So there you go. So that's the cost right now. Only the softwares and only the energy and stuff like that for the three months that you're going to be working on that specific project and then you add your profit like your time like how much are you going to be charging this is just like the operational cost let's say it and then you add the the money that's actually going to cost you and that's why 3d can get very expensive that's why triple a projects can get very expensive because that's how they budget the whole stuff for big projects as well they're gonna they're gonna 
try to count how much each artist is going to take or, or how much artist is going to be worth and then all of the softwares and licenses and things and that's the total cost of the project that's just a very rough way to do it right but it's it's important that you guys know why things are as expensive as they can be now if you're pirating the software if you don't care about energy because you're <laughs> You're using solar well then your costs can be lower but you're also getting yourself into some risky situations that i would strongly suggest you don't do <laughs> yep hudson that's perfectly fine as well and that's another question that i get often like do i need to be a freelance to be a 3d artist no you can work at a studio everything has uh, like advantages and disadvantages what are the advantages of working in a studio well definitely you're gonna have something that's way more stable so you can expect a paycheck every 15 days or every month, which is cool. What are the disadvantages? You're not going to have as much flexible of a time. You need to fulfill a role, right? You need to, to do your obligations. Um, and as we've seen lately with, uh, with the layoffs and everything, even then, like if at one point the, the company like crashes or whatever, well, then it becomes a little bit difficult. Yes, Petros, that's right, exactly. So cost-wise, if you are like, hey, I want to save as much cost as possible, then maybe you are going to try and use Blender for everything. And that's great because that means that you're going to be saving. You can still charge the same amount that someone with all of the other things will charge, but you're going to get way more profit because you don't have to pay for all of the softwares. So it's all about a, a balance of, of how and, and where you, you, you use the money, right? Do we give him a more of a hunchback effect? Cause see that looks that looks cool. But look, that looks even cooler. What do you guys think? Does this look cooler? A little bit more predatory sort of look? Should we keep this one? Like more, more intense shape? Alston, I think I remember you, man, from, from Next Dude, right? You submitted your portfolio a couple of times? Yeah, Hudson, that's one of the best advices I can give people as well. Don't be picky. Hudson says, I've worked with someone selling chairs go for it if that can pay you the bills that's great because now your bills are paid and you can do like more more interesting stuff right yeah yeah i'm definitely i'm definitely referencing the elites as well my friend ideal ronnie do you see yourself launching any hand-painted premium course in the future i'm not sure again because i, I i've done hand-painted before but i'm not a specialist in hand-painted so maybe maybe like a basic course but i definitely need to learn a little bit more about that because I don't feel comfortable charging someone for something that I don't know as much of, right? Now, if I get better at it and I feel comfortable and I feel like the information that I can share is valuable, then at that point, I will do it. Oh, nice, man. You you went to Canada. That's great. Alston, the best thing you can do if you're in Canada right now, try to go to as many, like, conventions, meetings, um, brunches, like, things to meet people. Like, the more people you meet, the easier it will be to to transition into, like, a production job later on. So, get be as social as possible, man. There you go. Yeah, go to all the meetings, all the mixers, everything. Breakster, should I buy a screen tablet or a normal graphics tablet? Both of them will work just fine. Like, the tablet will not make you a better artist. It's just a tool. Um, I personally have a, a pen display, and I love it. But you're free to, again, to utilize whatever you you feel more comfortable and whatever your budget allows for, right? Huion has some very nice, like, budget tablets, like traditional tablets, as well as pen displays. That's the one I'm using right now. So I strongly recommend that one. Do you see people that have a second job on top of the industry career? They always want it. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase that, childish? What What do you mean by a second job?
Huion has a sale going on right now. I was thinking about getting... Yeah, check the... Um, uh, there's a video that we did a couple of months ago for the review of this tablet. The, the uh, Huion Canvas 13 Pro. It's really good. I think it's a really nice size. So it's not too big, not too small. So just, just right. Halo. They're very top heavy though. Like I, I do like the idea, like the proportions. I think they're a little bit too heavy on, on this side. But I do like the fact that they're pushing the, the lower back. Next portfolio review is next week, uh, Div Jam. Next week. Hot sun, thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, it was it was a good time over there at, at next to it. I learned I, I learned a lot when I was there. As an instructor, I mean. But now our directions were different. There we go, guys. So today was a good day, I think. We went from this, which was just a basic like head, to this, which is a a different type of character, right? You can see that he did change quite a bit, especially this sort of like inclination. He's definitely going into the the meaner, like more evil side of things. But I like it. Santiago Von Drago. Hola, mi estimado. Un saludo. Argentina. Tienen muchas ganas de ir a Argentina. Dicen que sus cortes de carne allá son excelentes. Digo, aquí en el norte tenemos buenos cortes, pero... Sí he escuchado que los de allá son otro nivel. Yes, Alston. The, the stream will be available for you guys to check out tomorrow in YouTube. So if you miss some part of the, of the process so far, you can check it tomorrow in YouTube. Their designer course is not that good, though. Yeah. I mean... I don't like to... talk bad about others. So I'm gonna... I'm gonna reserve my comment there. I understand everyone is trying to do their best, and hey, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Tonio Estrada, are you working full-time at some studio or are you a freelancer? That's a great question. So, um, I've mentioned this before. I have three jobs, pretty much. I am a teacher at the university here in Saltillo. So, I teach. I do this. My channel, my courses, my mentorships. Hopefully soon, live workshops as well. And I also am the co-founder um, I'm associated with another um, person, and we have a studio that produces VR experiences. Uh, so far, we've been doing a lot of work for museums. So there's a very famous museum here in the city called uh, the Desert Museum, Museo del Desierto, and we work very closely with them to generate experiences, VR experiences for, for the public. Um, we produce, we design. I'm the art director, actually, there. It's a small studio, um, so... So it's not like a big, big number, but we do that here. Yeah, Hyperlab, Hyperlab Studio. We've done some architectural visualization as well, some security training. VR is, is what we focus the most in, to be honest. We've done some AR stuff as well, some renders, you know. So we're a small production house. So those are my three main jobs and sometimes that, that's the thing like sometimes I have more work on some uh, on some elements like I'm teaching a lot or sometimes I'm doing a lot of like discourses and sometimes I'm doing other elements what do you think about critics in your student art submissions feels like it won't take so much as a portfolio review and we will learn more space I, 
I'm not sure I understand, Rafa. What do you mean by critiques? I, I critique the portfolios. Like, I, I, I give feedback during the portfolio reviews. Or, or you mean having more people critiquing or giving feedback? Childish. Uh... Okay, uh, let, let me see if I try if I can understand your question, Childish. You mean how common is it for someone to be on the industry on their like dream job? and then have a second job on top of that? How common is that? I would say that's quite common. And sometimes you're gonna, like, I find people who are doing like completely different things. Like I remember a friend of mine, he would do cooking on the weekends. So he would sell food. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was hamburgers, like um, very specialized sort of like hamburgers. So during the week he would do a 3D, he would work at the studio. And then on the weekends he would cook hamburgers because he loved doing that. So. It's common, but, but that's more like a human thing. Like, a lot of people had side jobs and stuff. Now, as for, for our related stuff, like, have second jobs. Or a lot of people do freelance, so mo I would say most people in the industry, if they're working at the studio, they would accept a freelance gig if they have time to do it during the weekends, for instance. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively common, I would say. Like I do, like yesterday, uh, a friend of mine asked me if I could do like a little side job for him. He wants to 3D print a couple of keychains for his clients. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, if I can do it and I can, I can get a little extra money there, I'll do it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with any way to to earn a living, right? Instead of reviewing whole portfolios and make us submit our pieces, like that would take like one piece. Yeah, or you you got you you still got time. We're gonna be having our portfolio review next week, so um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Freelance can definitely yeah. Dude, that that's what I was selling earlier, right? Like you you need to take a break every now and then. Like don't overwork yourself to death. But at the same time, if you can make a little bit of an extra buck here and there, well, go for it. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Let's let's mask this because I feel like he's looking down. And just to finish this, let's go to the hands. Rest. Ah, mess this up. But we're gonna have to do the ice anyway later, so. How do you develop your observational skills? I'll show you. I'll actually do a quick example of how I do it. Do it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So you submit the file instead of, of submitting the portfolio. So you submit the file and then and then I work on top of the file of this is how I would change it or this is what I would like modify or whatever. Yeah, that uh, that that works. Yeah, we, I think we can do something like that. Let me let me see how we could like introduce a a concept like that. How often do you feel burnt out? I feel that sadly that's quite common for artists. Yeah, I would say about every three or six months. <laughs> so every three or six months, I would go for, through my like depression stage where I feel like very, very burnt out and I don't want to do anything. And I'll probably just like stop doing 3D for like a week or something to get get some like energy back. Yeah, it's uh, and, and this content creation thing, it's, it's also a little bit uh, demanding. Energy wise, feeling wise, like um, that, that's something that's not like said too much but imagine putting a lot of effort on, onto like some content piece like a short or like a video and then just submit it and then no one watches it it's just like my like like fuck why <laughs> you feel like a failure at that point but then you remember that there's a lot of other variables out there so it's uh you kind of have to develop a little bit of uh um what's the word like um 
a little bit of a thick skin as well for that. Only like two times a year. <laughs> ah, two or three times a year, I would say. Right, David? It's right about our... Uh, more or less. Like, every two or three courses, I would be just like, oh man, I'm a little bit burnt out. Oh, Tonyo, that's a great question. No, no, I don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth it. Why don't you use your freelance work uh, and your studio work as, as your portfolio? Like, usually, theoretically, the stuff that you do at a studio is your portfolio. So that translates to your portfolio. And yeah, Hudson, I, I know, I know. More and more times? <laughs> like, four or five times? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, the, the channel has been growing nicely, guys. Thank you, everyone. And if you're not subscribed uh, here in Twitch or in, in YouTube, uh, we could really appreciate it because it really helps to, to keep growing and, and get more people to, to see the stuff that we're doing. Oh, okay, I see, I see, Tonyo. Um, I would try to then make a project. Like, don't try to, to do one project every month, but try to pick a project that's going to take you maybe like three or four months so that you can do maybe three a year. And, and just like every now and then when you have the energy and, and, uh, and the motivation to do it, work on it. Because it is important to, to do a little bit of that side stuff. And if you find some of the stuff in your freelance work to be portfolio worthy, go for it. Like include it. Your live view count is bigger. I, I'm not even seeing the live view count, so I'm not sure how much we're doing right now. But, uh, but thanks, man. Uh, which is better to start a human, a human sculpture or insert brushes? I like sea spheres. They give me more control and they give me more original results. I would say, but uh, insert multi mesh are not bad. Three months on something is huge time. That's normal time, someone, and that's a very. Oh, I'm gonna move full screen because this does make me mad. We are so used to having everything done so fast and so quickly thanks to social media that we are forgetting to value or give value to the things that take time. Things take time. If you go ask the top artists in the industry how long did they took them for to for them to do like the best characters like Kratos from God of War, it's going to be 3, 6, 8, 9 months to do just one character. So don't put yourself through that comparison lens where you need to produce an amazing character in a week that's not how it works okay that's not how it should work like yes we need to be efficient yes we need to be able to generate cool stuff relatively quickly but we should not go to a point where we are pretty much like burning ourselves out or killing ourselves just to finish something really really fast so give yourself enough time to finish something and I talked about this like a couple of weeks ago. It's not you're not gonna get the same result from working on something for one hour, two hours, eight hours, than by doing this for 24 hours, 48 hours, a hundred hours. And, and you can see it on this guy right here. We've only been working on this guy for two hours. And so people might be like, oh yeah, this is done. Just go retopologize and texture it, get it into the game, and we're ready. I'm gonna spend more time on this guy because I really want to make a cool, a cool result, like a cool evolution from this guy right here to this guy right here. So even if this takes me 50 hours to finish, I'm gonna be doing it. Okay? I don't care that it's gonna take me 50 hours or 100 hours as long as it's great. Okay? Sometimes we need to be patient. We need to give art time to evolve, to grow, and for us as artists to improve. So that's my advice. And with that, my friends, we're gonna be closing today's stream because we've already gone over our two hours and I got some other stuff to do as well. So so yeah serious thanks for the thanks for the for the kind words and uh thank you everyone for being part of this amazing community again if you're not following us please follow us it's not gonna cost anything to you you're gonna see more of our content on your on your home screen that's about it but it's really gonna help the channel grow and reach more people if you want to check some of our premium courses if you want to like support us economically the best way to do it is through our premium courses which is going to be linked here on the on the chat in just a second it's also going to be on the description of the videos you can go into our discord channel as well and join more than 3,000 students and amazing artists that are out there growing learning and improving so that's it guys thank you very much have a great weekend i'll see you back next week for our portfolio review live here on the channel and well don't forget always learning always improving